Hello and welcome to your final lesson within the rhetorical terminology that we use here in AP language. We're looking at syntax now. Um, previously, you should have been taught something about syntax. You should have some form of understanding about your grammatical understandings and concepts, but if not, again, this is all starting from square one. I'm not going to teach you the basics. I'm going to teach you the basics about syntax. So this is not a lesson on phrases or clauses or subjects or predicates or verbs, anything like that. If you need help, you need to come chat with me or you need to do some extra research outside of class. So having said that, hopefully you have your terminology packet in front of you and um, we'll talk about syntax. So what is syntax? It's that grammatical structure. How something is arranged, it's how they convey their desired point. Now you're going to see in bold that essential idea. Syntax does impact, contribute, and enhance the meaning and effect of a piece. Having said this, we do need to understand that syntax is not going to be a be-all, end-all. You're going to see in a little bit that College Board does not necessarily require syntax for a strong analysis. So, we're going to work on syntax. However, College Board recognizes a strong analysis with syntax is difficult. So, you're going to see in bold, always, 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 without question, without fail, analyze diction and tone. Don't come to me with a timed right where you don't talk about the type of words and how the words make you feel or how the author is implying them. Never come to me like that. But that bottom bullet point, decide if syntax is worth the challenge on the prompt that you are facing. If you are reading a prompt and you're already struggling with the subject and the purpose, there is no reason for you to then try to add the stress of a syntax analysis. Stick with the diction and tone and the SOAPS model put syntax on the back burner for when you rewrite it. So, phrases and clauses versus subjects and predicates. And you're going to see on my left hand side the difference between a phrase and a clause. So we look at related words without subject, a predicate, or both. That phrase right there. Whereas my clause, it's the group of words related with a subject and a predicate. You really, really need to kind of go through and understand what a subject and predicate is, but I did the most basic example I could provide you. So apples are red. With that, obviously the apple is the subject, so it's my main target within a sentence. It's the main idea. Whereas the phrase red, or rather the word, apples are red, that word red, it modifies and it describes what my apple is. Therefore, that becomes my predicate. The predicate modifies thanks to a verb. We need to have those kind of established. You need to look at what gerunds are. You really need to understand the function and structure of a sentence. You will learn more of them in your senior year because right now I'm just trying to get the basics of how to elevate your writing, but Mr. Sable and AP Literature usually take the next step of really honing and focusing it. So, there are 10 methods to approach a syntax analysis, and I know the worksheet says 8. I don't know why, but I guess I can't count again. So, the big question, when we start talking about syntax, the big question we answer is, how is it effective in dealing the idea of the work? How does it help to get that idea across? So, the first thing you can analyze is sentence length, and I'm not going to read all five of those bullet points, but you can see, count the words, or rather, look at the sentence and determine. If it's something as simple as no, it's abrupt. If I have a sentence from Edgar Allan Poe, it's much longer, and typically, the longer the sentence, the more you are going to start to lose interest. You might even start to see more of an abstract or philosophical idea being developed. Number of sentences. Count them. And again, put a slash mark at the end of each sentence so you can count those numbers. If the passage I give you is one paragraph, try to not necessarily worry about the number of sentences. If, let's say, I had three, three paragraphs, that's when you might really want to look at the number of sentences. That way you can ask yourself, why is there two sentences in one paragraph, eight in another, and then three in another? Why is there not enough consistency? Why is it not 555 five, five, or something along those lines? Those are things that allow you to think and to dialogue with the text a little bit more. 
Um, the third thing you can do is to look at the rhythm of the sentence. So does it flow? Is it cohesive? Um, that last bullet point about grammatical errors, it's a huge concept to really consider. If the person is not having strong readability, if I'm approaching it and I am struggling to understand the main intent, is there a purpose to the grammatical errors? Is that a feature we need to consider? Or is the writer maybe not literate? In which case then we can start to really change the way we approach it. Your next one is sentence beginnings. Look for a variety. Look for a pattern. One or the other. You will see one most likely. Especially if let's say I'm doing a uh, process analysis. First you will do this. Second you will do that. You might see that pattern, um, or you might pick up on the fact that they use transitional words, in which case we flow from one idea to another idea to another. If you pick up on a pattern, what's the main goal of the pattern? Why have a pattern in the first place? Why follow a parallel structure? What could the intent be? Your next piece is to look at the voice, because typically with voice we look at diction and tone, but in this scenario, you might want to consider if it's an active or a passive form of diction. If it's active, you can see the, the subject and the predicate change in terms of order. So active states the action. The students made progress. Whereas if I'm being passive, I'm stating the being. So progress was made by the students. And suddenly I add extra words, I change the intent, that's something that you may want to look at. The arrangement of ideas, and you can see there's a whole series of uh, bullet points up on that screen. On your handout, they're all detailed. They are all very, very much explained. Um, and so, for example, um, look at the loose sentence. This is when your main point is front-ended. It's right off the cuff. You cannot miss it. We reached Edmonton that morning after a turbulent flight and with some exciting experiences. My main goal, I made it to Edmonton. Whereas at the other end, um, the periodic where I have an end loaded sentence, that morning after a turbulent flight and some exciting, um, should say exercises, we reached Edmonton. So look at where the main idea is, look where my main subject is. If it's at the beginning, it's tending to possibly have the reader consider that this is the most important thing. We don't want you to mess that mi uh, or miss the main point. If it's an end loaded sentence, they might be challenging the reader. They might be seeing if the reader will pay attention. So some things to truly consider. Um, and you can go through the rest of those. Um, parallel structure, I know you guys have learned. Antithesis, you will learn more of that when we get to rhetorical devices. Everything else is explained and it has an example. The seventh way to analyze syntax is to analyze the type of sentence that it is. So look and see if it has a statement or if it's a question, if it um, fragments. Again, grammatical errors can be done on purpose and we tend to look at the, the main purpose with that. Sentence structure. So simple sentence um, and you can see in your packet um, there is actually uh, these examples already there. So the simple sentence has one subject, one predicate. Whereas a compound sentence is going to have two or more independent clauses with coordinating conjunctions. They're typically with transitional words and phrases, a semicolon or colon itself. Now, the complex sentence is an independent clause and a dependent clause. So if I only have that dependent clause, it's not a correct sentence. So again, go back to the beginning, look at what a clause and a phrase is if that's not sticking. Compound complex sentences, on the other hand, have one or more, or two or more, I'm sorry, independent clauses and one at least dependent clause. Now this could change because compound complex sentences tend to have a very different structure. The next thing you can do is look at the word order. Is there a special way that the words are placed? Is it, are, are words placed next to, like, um, take into account if there is a word that stands out to you for whatever reason, what word is it next to? What two words 
Is it between? And is that done on purpose? It sounds like I'm calling a lot of this, like I'm looking for controversy, I'm looking for something. But really, you are looking for something. It, it's just you don't know what you're looking for. So you kind of have to play a guessing game and pretend that you're a detective or a sleuth and really look at the, con uh, the, the nuances that we see within works. The tenth and final way to analyze syntax is the one thing that you're never allowed to write ever in a time write in an online writing portfolio piece in anything. You're not allowed to use a rhetorical question. The authors are, but you are not. So it's a question that no expects no answer. It's used to draw a point. It's designed to make sure you pick up on the, the main goal, but it is in no shape, way, or form something for you to um, really ever use in your own writing. So there are methods of organization. There's a giant, it's 12 boxes, um, ways to look at um, methods of organization. So you can see if I, and look at the, the word at the top of that list. So if you're going for elegance, you may want to think about writing polished or using a, a classic form. You want to be graceful about your transitions. You may want to be symmetrical. Make sure everything's the right amount of sentences. Um, the idea of this, this chart is to provide you the methods of looking at how something is structured. If you're seeing certain keywords, and maybe these keywords will help trigger you. That's what this chart is for. Now, other organizational ideas, um, the other, there's a long list of bullet points. I won't go through them, but um, you can see that on that list, you can choose simple to complex organization or um, progressing ideas from uh, first to second to third order of importance. You can determine the syntax structure. You can determine how everything comes together. But these are terms that we typically see when we talk about organization. They're terms that you will eventually see on your AP exam, um, especially in that multiple choice category. That's where we see a lot of it. Now to wrap this up, just like diction or tone, you can use these on a timed write for a short while. But again, don't get dependent. And I know this went by very quickly, but again, Syntax is not going to be my main priority. I am going to work with you. I am going to make sure that you know what syntax is. But, and this is again the but, my priority is diction and tone and finding ways for you to learn those rhetorical devices. That's where I'm going to see more growth than anything. Syntax is not going to always be the reason why you get a nine. It can help you, but Syntax is difficult for some people, and College Board has acknowledged that in the last four years. Now, this doesn't mean never do syntax, avoid syntax completely. Just do it in a different way. Choose a different approach, and that's where you're really going to want to go. Now, having said that, that is the end of the presentation, and I appreciate you guys watching this. We'll have that one question quiz tomorrow. Make sure that you do have your notes with you that you've either taken or printed out and added. And um, next week, we'll be starting, or actually later, uh, soon. I'll just go soon. We'll be starting rhetorical devices. You are going to get a large packet. It is going to be very... Um, heavy with information, but it's not designed to terrify you. It's terms that will help alleviate uh, your stress on that multiple choice. It will also help you as you're writing, give you a different balance, and it might help you to extend some of your thoughts that were previously a little bit more um, maybe underdeveloped. Having said that, I'll see you guys later and have a great evening.